Hey guys, welcome once again to Mr. Van Lowe's poorly monetized, low budget science channel. All right, today we're going to talk about 9.5 for IB physics, uh, the Doppler effect. Very exciting. So your learning objectives for this lesson, you should be able to describe the Doppler effect through wavefront diagrams and solve problems involving frequency and wavelength shifts as well as the speeds of source or observer. Okay, so quick introduction. What is the Doppler effect? Well, if you think about standing near a highway when an emergency vehicle goes by, what happens? And you can pause the video and think about it for a second. Okay, that was a second. Uh, the answer is you get a high-pitched sound that quickly transitions to a lower pitch sound when the objects go by, okay? So you start high and then you go low. And it sounds just a little bit like this. Okay. So that of course is a train rather than an emergency vehicle, but you should all be very familiar with this. Even the tires from the vehicle going by uh, no, no sirens at all will make a similar transition from a uh, high frequency to a low frequency as they go by. So that's the Doppler effect in a nutshell. And if you want a definition, uh, there it is. The change in the observed frequency of a wave that happens whenever there's relative motion between the source and the observer. Okay, so that's important. We're going to cover that a little in a little more detail here. So here we have a diagram and you can see an emergency vehicle here. There's an ambulance and wave fronts are being emitted from the ambulance. Okay, so it's sitting here with its siren on and let's say the ambulance siren is a constant frequency. It doesn't really work that way, but for the sake of my example here, let's just go with it. So that means that F wave fronts will be emitted per second by our source and that of course is the uh, frequency. So whenever you see F in a Doppler effect problem, you know that what you're dealing with is the initial frequency at the sound of the source. Okay, so uh, we're going to assume that the speed of sound is constant here, uh, at least for our initial setup. Later on we'll see that that is not the case for all of our scenarios, but for right now it is. Okay. So, recall that wavelength is equal to velocity divided by frequency. We've already defined frequency, and our velocity in this case would be the speed of sound, roughly 340 meters per second, depending on the temperature and maybe a couple of other factors. But, uh, here we go. So, there are definitions. Velocity of sounds are medium. Uh, for V, uh, lambda is wavelength, and F is the frequency of sound at the source, at the source. That is important. And we'll come back to that momentarily. Okay, so here now we see that our vehicle is moving. And what's happening is we're seeing that our wave fronts are being compressed in front of the vehicle, which is moving to the right of the, sc uh, the, right of the screen. And behind the vehicle, the wave fronts are being elongated. Okay, so there's there's our Doppler shift right there. Uh, here we have an observer, and it is, of course, an IB physics student playing in traffic. I don't know why you guys like to do this, but there you go. Okay, so our source is moving toward the IB physics student with a velocity, which we will define as U sub S. And... Uh, Alternatively, our observer could move toward the object, and we'll, we'll come to that example a little bit later. Uh, if the observer was moving toward the object, we would see a similar compression of the wave fronts. And in either case, as I just said, our wavelengths are going to be shortened. <clears throat> if uh, the vehicle is moving away from the observer, our wavelengths will be elongated. And we've already talked about that as well. So, what to do, what to do. So, uh, our new wavelength can be calculated 
uh, where the object is moving toward the observer by subtracting the distance traveled by the source from the original wavelength in a certain amount of time. And that looks like this. So we have uh, lambda prime. So this is our shifted wavelength. And that is equal to our initial wavelength when the object is standing still minus some distance. Okay, in order to find this distance, we need to determine this amount of time. And the amount of time is just equal to the period of the original wavelength. Okay, so we call that period T, no surprise. And that then gives us this equation. So, uh, lambda prime, our shifted wavelength, our Doppler shifted wavelength, is equal times uh, the velocity of sound through air times the period of one wavelength. And you may recognize this equation as distance being equal to velocity times time, right? Okay, we then subtract from this distance, our initial wavelength, the distance traveled by our object experiencing velocity u sub s, okay? And we multiply that by, again, the period of the wavelength. Okay, we can then factor out that period and we get this equation here after factoring. Okay, we then know that period is inverse frequency, so we can substitute t for uh, inverse frequency, 1 divided by f. And we get this new equation where our shifted wavelength is equal to the velocity of speed of uh, the velocity of sound through air minus the velocity of the source divided by the frequency of the source. Okay, this is the frequency of the source, and to get to our data booklet equation, what we're looking for is the shifted frequency, okay, the Doppler shifted frequency, which we're going to call F prime. Okay, F prime then is going to be equal to the velocity of sound through air, remember this is constant, divided by the shifted wavelength. Okay, and a little bit of substitution then, we'll put this in our denominator, and we can then further clean this up by multiplying by the inverse of inverse frequency, and that will give us our data booklet, um, well, the start of our data booklet equation where F prime is equal to frequency, multiplied by this quantity, the velocity of sound through air, divided by the velocity of sound through air minus the velocity of the source. Okay, this is going to give us a higher frequency or pitch, and the reason for that is because if we have a smaller value in our denominator, that produces a larger value over here. Okay, so now we're gonna look at a source moving away, and again, our student is playing in traffic. Get out of there! Anyway, uh, so, in this case, our wavelength is going to elongate, giving a lower frequency or pitch, and that means we need a larger value in the denominator in order to produce a, a smaller frequency. Okay, so when setting up problems, you need to decide if the pitch is going to be higher or lower. Okay, so the way to do that is actually pretty simple. You just think about your train. And think about whether or not the object is moving toward you or away from you. And if the object is moving toward you, you're going to have a higher pitch. If it's moving away, you're going to have a lower pitch. Pretty straightforward. So that then brings us to the equation that is actually in your data booklet. And it only says moving source, and then it gives you this plus minus sign, and that's where you have to decide if your frequency needs to be bigger or smaller. Remember, a larger frequency is going to require a smaller value in the denominator, so that means you need a minus sign. A smaller frequency, or a lower pitch, means that you need a larger value down here, so that means you're going to add. Okay. Doppler effect. Uh, so let's imagine we have a stationary source and the observer is moving toward the source 
uh, with that velocity uh, u sub s. Now in this case, we're actually increasing the velocity of air through sound, okay? Uh, the velocity of sound in air. And actually, I need to adjust this slightly. There we go. Oh, such professional. Okay, so, uh, so now our velocity of sound in air is going to be the normal stationary velocity of sound in air plus the velocity of the moving observer. Okay, note that we have redefined u sub s, and so you need to be careful, as always, to, to define your variables in IB physics very, very carefully. So, consequently, when we move toward the source, uh, this produces a slightly different equation where f sub prime is now equal to our initial frequency of the source times the quantity, the velocity of sound for a stationary object plus uh, the velocity of the observer, in this case, divided by the velocity of sound in air. Again, these are both when stationary. Okay, I've not included the algebra here because I was in a little bit of a hurry, but uh, the SOCOS textbook has a uh, very straightforward uh, math that you can take a look at. It, it's not difficult. Uh, I was just lazy and in a hurry. Uh, anyway, there you go. <clears throat> Again, coming together is going to produce a higher pitch or frequency, and this is an easy way to check your work. Uh, if you have objects coming together, and you've produced a lower shifted frequency than your initial frequency, you know you've made an algebra mistake and you need to go check it. When the observer is traveling away from the source, uh, we will have a smaller frequency, uh, a lower pitch, and that equation is given by this. I don't need to go through all the variables at this point. I think all we need uh, to know is that we have intuitively a lower pitch. Just think of your train and that special sound. Okay, so for the data booklet, a moving observer is given by frequency f prime is equal to the frequency of your object, stationary, uh, multiplied by the quantity, the velocity of sound in air, plus or minus the velocity of the object, divided by, again, the velocity of sound in air for a stationary object. Okay, and you need to decide if your problem requires a higher, higher or lower pitch, just to be very explicit about this. Your rule of thumb is coming together gives a higher pitch. Moving apart gives a lower pitch. Straight, very straightforward. Okay. For light, uh, things get a little tricky if you're moving at a very, very high velocity, um, a significant percentage of the speed of light. And in that case, uh, we would definitely have to include relativity in our calculation of our Doppler shift. I'm not actually sure if uh, the IB physics option covers that, because there is an option for relativity, and I need to look it over. I don't, I don't teach that option, but... Maybe someday. Anyway, uh, for objects with lower velocities, we just use an approximation. And it looks like this, uh, where we have this delta F divided by F equals V divided by C, approximately. And yeah, that's it. We, did, we don't need to talk about anything else, right? No, we need to define our variables. So let's do that. Um, V is equal to the velocity of the light source or observer, in this case. F is a frequency of light emitted at the source. Uh, change in F is the apparent change in frequency. And C is the velocity of light. And since uh, velocity of light is equal to frequency times wavelength, it follows that our change in wavelength divided by our wavelength uh, at the source, uh, yes, will be equal to uh, the velocity of the object divided by the change in light. So there you go. Usually uh, what we're talking about here would be a star, 
uh, possibly a planet uh, or light reflecting off a planet. Uh, there are a few scenarios you can imagine where this would be useful information. Uh, usually it's either a redshift or a blue shift. A redshift would be an object moving away from us. A blue shift would be an object moving toward us. Um, typically in astronomy, objects are redshifted because the universe appears to be expanding. Okay, um, <clears throat> but there are... There are exceptions to that. Um, yes. So objects moving toward us have a blue shift. Yes. Objects moving away show a red shift. I've already said that. Okay, your checkout. I can describe the Doppler effect through wavefront diagrams. We've covered that in some detail. Uh, you should also now be able to solve problems involving frequency and wavelength shifts and speeds of source or observer. And I recommend you try some practice problems at this time. This has been Mr. Van Lowe's low budget, poorly monetized science channel. Uh, do not click like, do not click subscribe, and have a great day.